We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Hey everybody, welcome back. Got another phenomenal episode, which is of course why you can pause and give it five stars. Okay, I don't really know what that does again, but I think it boosts my ranking. Um, Please just do it. Seems like the right thing to do if you're listening to this amazing podcast. So today's going to be a great episode. I've got with me Yuval Levin. He is the Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at AEI, which is the American Enterprise Institute, which seeks to maintain a culture where virtue flourishes in tandem with freedom and material progress. He's also an author and a columnist. Uh, Most recently wrote the book, A Time to Build, From Family and Community to Congress and the Campus, How Recommitting to Our Institutions Can Revive the American Dream. Also an editor of National Affairs. It's a quarterly journal dedicated to helping Americans think a little bit more clearly about our public life and rise more ably to the challenge of self-government. He's a graduate of American University and University of Chicago, where he earned his Ph.D. You all, thanks so much for being on the show. What's your Ph.D. in? I I don't actually have that in my notes. My Ph.D. is uh, from the University of Chicago from a, a program called the Committee on Social Thought, which sort of combines political theory and uh, the classics. And it's a kind of uh, liberal education degree that's a very University of Chicago thing. But for me, it's basically a political philosophy degree, more or less. OK, I find that pretty fascinating. I did my master's in public policy, but I've certainly become more enthralled by political philosophy, more generally speaking, especially as I've gotten more involved in politics, which kind of happened all of a sudden. OK, so national affairs. I want to read an excerpt from the inaugural issue, which is in its 10th year. So congratulations, by the way. Um, it says this. We'll begin from confidence and pride in America, from a sense that our challenge is to build on our strengths to address our weaknesses, from the conviction that chief among those strengths are our democratic capitalism, our ideals of liberty and equality under the law, and our roots in the long-standing traditions of the West. We will seek to cultivate an open-minded empiricism, decent respect for the awesome complexity of life and society." Do you think there's a gap there? Is, is that what National Affairs was trying to fulfill that the other conservative policy journals were perhaps lacking in? You know, a, a shorter way to put that piece that you just, uh, the, that piece of our opening editorial that you just read is that we're conservatives. Um, and we're, we're a conservative journal that is interested in the intersection of public policy and political theory that we were just describing in a sense. Um, and so I, I think that's a, a disposition toward policy, a sense of the limits of what government can do, but also of the need for, uh, for governing institutions in society. And I do think there's something of a gap there. I mean, I, I think a lot of us on the right today incline toward a kind of anti-institutional disposition that um, leaves us not interested enough in public policy debates. It leaves us not interested enough in thinking about how to govern and more interested in the kind of bigger questions of elites and the public and, uh, and, and, and questions of power. These are very important questions. But National Affairs is really dedicated to the idea that conservatives need to think about how to govern the country because ultimately uh, we're the party that should be trusted to govern the country. And so the magazine does try to fill in that space and connect the right's attitudes with what it takes to make responsible governing decisions. So I take it you wouldn't describe yourself as more libertarian because it would seem to me that in the academic circles of libertarianism that you can, you can always find a reason to not take action. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm not a libertarian. I'm not a libertarian for a few reasons. I mean, I, I certainly believe in the dignity and freedom of the individual, but I'm not an individualist. I don't think that human beings can thrive apart from community and ultimately my my sort of anthropology, my sense of the human person begins with the idea that every human being is somehow fallen or imperfect or crooked um, and that we require a kind of formation before we can be ready to be free. And that makes me a conservative. Uh, the, the, the institutions that provide that formation are what conservatives want to conserve. So I have a lot of respect for libertarian friends, but I'm certainly not a libertarian myself. 
And how do you, how do you think we're doing as a Republican party? You, you clearly consider yourself conservative. I won't label you as a Republican if you don't want me to, of course, but is there, is there room for the sort of big think that we need? And, and how do you see the dynamics of the different strands of Republicanism playing out again with both the more libertarian side and the more action oriented side? Again, is, is there room for big ideas and how do we properly place those against longstanding principles of limited government? Well, you know, in one sense, this is always a challenge for 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 the right, and has always been a challenge for Republican Party for as long as it's been the conservative party in our politics. Um, obviously, there are ways in which we're not doing well at all right now. I mean, I think the last few years have not been a great time for these kinds of conservative ideas, and our party has become uh, has fallen into something of a of a dispute between libertarians and populists, and conservatives are. Not exactly either one of those things, though there are strands of libertarianism and of populism in what I would consider um, the tradition of American conservatism. But at the same time, I also think that this is actually a moment of real intellectual ferment where we are coming to grips with some realities of American life that we've needed to come to terms with for some time, that the right and left both need to come to terms with, um, ways in which the political logic of the 1990s and before is not as adequate as we might like and ways that we need to think about how our country has been changing. And I think conservatives offer a free society, a a way of dealing with change, a way of making change continuous with its history. And in the United States, that's enormously important, a way to see how the, 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 the changes our country is going through are can be dealt with by rooting ourselves in our own political tradition, in the tradition of the founding, um, in the tradition of American political development. I think conservatives now could be enormously useful to the country in thinking about how to confront its contemporary challenges, but that's generally not what we're doing. I mean, I, I think we're stuck in a in a kind of culture war mode where we've persuaded ourselves that we're at the edge of an abyss, that the left is about to win every fight, and we're too panicked, we're too defensive, and it's not my view. I don't think the left is about to win every fight. I think w- we we lose when we fail to offer the country something attractive and constructive, and at the moment, we too often do fail to do that. This gets to another question about where the culture of the country is going, and are we increasingly becoming a culture that wants that action, that demands action, that demands a clear and easy to understand solution? Because, because what conservatives often offer, and, and I agree with your take on all this, what conservatives often offer is the proper framework by which to govern, the proper framework by which to solve problems. Okay, so it's, it's the how. And the left always offers a what. They say, okay, if, if wages are too low, we have a solution for that. We raise them. We make a law and they're raised and boom, we're done. Look at us. We're, we're taking action. So there's, there's no limiting principles to this, right? And there's no consideration of second and third order effects. You know, is it becoming harder and harder to make that proper argument about the how? Because that populist strand you're talking about in the conservative movement, and I wanted to stop you and ask you how you define populism, because it seems to me that everybody defines it a little bit differently. It seems to me that it's the first emotional whim you have and belief that you have when confronted with a problem, and that and that's just the solution you demand. To me, that seems like populism. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I, I would say populism is a sense that our our national life is defined by a struggle between elites and the larger public, and that the public, generally speaking, is in the right in every case. And I, I just think the logic of our Constitution is that nobody is right in every case, and not the elites, not the public, uh, n- not our, not anybody. And so... I'm inclined to that logic and to think that we need institutions and structures that protect us from making big mistakes, which is a lot of what our constitution offers us. And sometimes it is the public, the people who make those big mistakes, and sometimes it's the experts or the elites. Um, and so I, I, am, I, I am opposed to both technocratic elitism and democratic populism. Um, I'm a constitutionalist. Right. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. That, that's why the how... The Constitution tells us how to govern, and conservatism is conserving that how, while also buttressing it up with cultural institutions that I I think libertarianism doesn't prioritize enough. 
I want to get to the whole conversation on institutions in a minute, but I want to want to go back to what I mentioned before because you, you guys st- study so much on American culture at AEI. So how has our culture changed? Are, are we becoming more of a collectivist society? Because uh, it seems to me when I look around, like we're demanding more and more from government and that the politician that promises you the most things with your own money paid for by your own tax dollars seems to be the most likely to get elected. And is that reversible? Yeah, I, I think that we have seen a change in American expectations of politics and American expectations of civil society in ways that are related to each other. Generally speaking, I, I would say th- th- this has always been a problem. This argument that the, the how matters and that the how should be prioritized is never an easy political argument to make um, because you always end up saying to people who are very excited about some solution to a problem that they think is going to work great, you're always saying to them, well, w- we need to think about how we're using power here. We need to think about w- what's actually plausible and what's likely to work. And that, that's not where any you know, that's not where you want to be in politics, even though it's true. But I think there's a way in which Americans traditionally have tended to think about solutions as arising from the bottom up and not from the top down. And particularly that we've tended to think about solutions as happening in that space that is between the individual and the national government, the space where we have the institutions of civil society from family and community and religion to local government and state government, to the private economy, educational institutions. That's where we generally think problems get solved. And it does seem to me that for half a century now in America, we have been emptying out that space um, as the as both a kind of radical individualism and especially uh, a, a central national government have encroached on that space we've come to think less and less about how problems could be solved there. And instead, we tend to think that when we confront problems as individuals, we need to look to a central national government for solutions. I I think that tendency has been ruinous. I think that tendency is at the heart of a lot of the problems we have, and that recovering our ability to be problem solvers as individuals and as a society means recovering that space between the individual and the state recovering the institutions that fill that space and charging them with real responsibility, expecting problems to be solved more often at the local level than at the national level, uh, I think is the only way to get to a politics that is both realistic and effective. Yeah, I think that's really well put. Um, Where I see the biggest sign of decline in that area, it seems to be over the last few months during the pandemic, I've been consistently surprised by how willing people are to advocate for far more authoritarian policy, whether it's been the clamoring at the national level for all states to have the exact same policy, which of course makes no sense, just based on the data and the differences in the population density across the country, the vast country that is, not a small one. And and it seems like we've really reached a peak there and we continue to see that. What are your thoughts on how our culture has defined our response to, to the pandemic? Yeah, I, I certainly agree with you. I, I think that the case for that kind of subsidiarity or federalism, um, bottom-up problem solving, is not just a principled case, though it is that. It's also a practical case. As you say, in a very complex society, this huge country where people live in some very different kinds of circumstances, it's just not likely that we're going to be able to solve problems in a centralized way, generally speaking. So that I think you could make the argument that from a principled point of view, a public health emergency might be a time when we would give government more power than we normally would. It's still just not a good idea as a a matter of actually solving the problems we confront in this crisis to centralize our response. And I think we've seen that by enabling governors and state legislatures, even mayors and, 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 and city councils to make decisions for themselves, Um, we enable more flexibility. We allow the country to respond in different ways to different kinds of problems. And we're just going to be better at addressing this if we don't think that there's one person in Washington who knows exactly how to do it. And the solution is to give that one person all the power. Um, I think the problem with that, as I say, is not just a matter of principle, it's a matter of practice. And we've seen reasons to be grateful for American federalism in the last few months We've seen ways in which the states have done better than the federal government uh, in many respects. 
but you know, on the whole, I I think that um, uh, the 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 the, re- the response of our country and its effectiveness has been mixed. I'm not a person who just thinks everything has gone horribly and this is proof that our system doesn't work. Um, certainly some things have not gone as well as we might have hoped. And early on, testing problems and other things that were very difficult to recover from have been a huge challenge. To me, what's worried me most is that we've been behind the curve over and over in the response to the pandemic. We've been reacting to problems and sometimes reacting well, um, but we've not been trying to see problems that are coming. And uh, on that front, I think we could be doing a lot better at the state and local level, but also at the federal level, where there are some predictable challenges, like how do you distribute a vaccine, in which we're hopefully going to have in, in five, six months? How do you, who, gets those first, uh, who, who gets those first doses? How do we think about that? Who has the responsibility for making decisions like that? I don't think we've gone far enough in figuring that out. I don't think we're ready for election-related problems um, from the the vast increase in mail-in voting and other things that are just going to happen, and we have to prepare for them. So there are some things where I think we could get ahead of the curve. But generally speaking, look, I I think our health system has done better than most. Um, But I think that in in some respects, decision-making at the national level has gone worse in our country than in others. Um, And we're lucky we have federalism. Yeah, I I can maybe really quibble about a couple of those points. I I think those are probably fair criticisms to an extent. I I think that the general consensus, though, around the country that the president should have saved everybody from any harm is, and I'm not saying you're saying that, but that is the sort of narrative that the media plays out, and it's it's pretty utterly ridiculous. And I always ask a very simple question, a, a question that you should ask when confronted with criticism, which is, where was the where was the why in the road when somebody went left and you told them to go right? You know, tell me when that was. Tell me when that decision point was. And of course, they can never do that because it's it's complicated. And because the reality is most people were doing their best they could with the information they had. And hindsight, of course, is more 2020. But honestly, I think that we disagree on just as a country, we disagree on actions that should have been taken months ago, still, even with all the data now. And I mean, there's a fundamental philosophical difference between those of us who believe in a more targeted approach, a limited approach, and those who are still clamoring for universal shelter in place orders. There's a true philosophical difference in how we see these things. I I do think they're planning the vaccine distribution in a fairly detailed manner. I I think the elections are a self-imposed problem because mail-in ballots, I'm sure you would agree, are, are going to be a disaster. And there's no planning for that because it's such a bad idea in the first place. It's like, we don't know how to solve that problem. That, that's why we don't believe in universal mail-in ballots. That, that conversation just drives me crazy. Um, I, I just can't believe it, honestly. And I, and I can't believe that people will go shopping every single day and then say that we can't go vote, where it's arguably less human interaction voting than there is shopping. It's a strange thing. So you vote, but before you were talking about filling the gap between the individual and the government and, and the need for those institutions. Um, but I guess the question... We, we sort of fail to answer in a very coherent way as conservatives. We, we talk about that stuff um, a lot. Um, well, maybe not as much as we should. But the question is always, what? how should government actually involve itself in that social formation or restoration? Uh, you know, what, what are there are there real policies that we could get behind that we could easily explain to people? Um, I, I think that the, that's a very important question for conservatives to think about. And it's a challenging question for us because, in a sense, what we're saying is that the important part of life happens outside of politics, and therefore we we have to think about what actually is the purpose of politics. And I would say we need to think about government as playing a supportive role in our society, not a lead role. And its purpose is to support the various means by which people flourish. That means creating a space, a protected space. Uh, a broad and open space in which people are able to lead flourishing lives, to make decisions uh, that shape their lives, to have access to these kind of formative institutions that can make us better people. The purpose of government is not to take over the role of these of these different institutions, but to sustain the space in which they can function. I, I think the, the, the way to think about the shape of society in light of that idea is as a kind of set of concentric rings, where in the center, you've got the individual and the family. Around that, you've got a community, a set of religious institution, educational institutions. Around that, you might have local government, you might have the private economy, you might have 
uh, a, a various sets of national institutions. And ultimately, around all of that, you've got a national government. And the purpose of each of these rings is to protect the one within it, which is more important than it. Um, mm -hmm. And so ultimately, the purpose of the national government is to protect the space in which the rest of this happens. That means national security. That means providing some of the preconditions for the rest of this to work, uh, protecting people's rights, uh, enforcing certain core laws and principles and ideals. Um, it doesn't mean taking over the role that communities can better play. It doesn't mean taking over the role that local government can better play. And I think if we try to envision the national government as having a fundamentally protective role, then we'd be in a better place for thinking about what kinds of things it can do, ways of encouraging these other institutions to function and helping people thrive. So, for example, even if we think for, that there is a role for the national government, say, in providing for people's welfare, uh, the welfare of low-income people, which I do think, uh, that role can be played by enabling local institutions to function better, by providing them with the resources that can help them play the role in people's lives that they ought to play to help people out of poverty. Rather than thinking that the federal government can take over that role, we should think about ways that it can support it, enable it, protect it. I think this is a basic difference between the left and the right. The, the, the left talks about the role of government in using metaphors of motion. They talk about social movements. They talk about progress of moving from here to there. The right talks about the role of government, or should, I think, using metaphors of space, not of motion, of creating room, of allowing people to have uh, th that protected space to grow and thrive. And it, it seems to me that that points to a very significant difference of opinion about that role of government. There is a role for government in the kind of conservative view that I have, but it is a protective and supportive role. And we should always ask ourselves when we think about a new public policy or program, is it playing that supportive role or is it displacing other institutions in our society that could do a better job at addressing this problem? Yeah, again, well, that's a, a fantastic way to put it. Um, and, and I think the left thinks that way because it feels good. Um, and it also yep. it, uh, camp it campaigns quite well also um, because because the reality is most, most voters are not are not super well educated on the intricacies of a particular welfare program, how many other well pro welfare programs already exist that are just like it, and how long this failed particular program has been uh, sucking away taxpayer dollars. I mean, people don't know these things. All they know is something's not working, and the person who's promising the most action seems to care the most. And caring yeah, I, um, is, a, is a very powerful political tool. I think that's a very powerful point. And th there's also, in some ways, a deeper difference of opinion about the nature of the human person between the left and the right, where I, I think we on the right tend to think that social problems are ultimately functions of, of failures of people to flourish individually. That is, we need to be formed to be able to make responsible decisions. And oftentimes, when, when social institutions fail, it's a failure of culture. It's a failure to make responsible decisions as much as it is uh, a, fa a failure of resources or an imbalance of power. I think the left tends much more to think about political life in terms of imbalances of power, of oppressor yeah. and oppressed. And the way to improve society is to fight against oppressors on behalf of the oppressed. Sometimes that's true. Some social problems are like that. But I think generally speaking, in a functional society like ours, our problems look much more like a failure to make responsible decisions. And the government can help people make these kinds of decisions. But if we think about that as being what's necessary, then it makes much less sense to believe that a national government is going to be in a position to create the circumstances for people to flourish. It makes much more sense to think that these conditions are created by formative institutions around us and that we should make sure that those can function. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating to talk to, to those on the left about that particular question. I mean, they they don't believe that personal responsibility almost has anything to do with it. Like choices almost have nothing to do with it. And they'll explain even if, even if you can show them that choices have something to do with it, they will still blame the system because the system forced the person to make those choices. Um, and it's a, it's just a it's a very difficult conversation to have and, and, and ultimately leads us nowhere, which is why it's so frustrating because um, 
it's 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 always blaming a you're, you're ghost hunting. I mean, you're always, you're always blaming yeah. a vague, a vague systemic problem that is purposefully undefined, I believe. Um, and uh, again, but in, in cynic, the cynic in me says that that's that's because you need something to continue to campaign on. Um, and, and, and you can't solve the problem and then have nothing to campaign on. I mean, uh, what a, if things are really good for people, then my God, what, who would the oppressor be? Um, it, 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 it removes the entire underlying philosophy. You, you say that um, uh, the family is the most important institution. Uh, we, we should all agree on that. Um, that's the, the center of the circle. Uh, what are other examples of institutions? Sometimes I think this is a bit of an academic term, and I think we need to define it for people. Yeah. Yeah. Institution can be a very complicated term to define. Um, the, the book I put out earlier this year called A Time to Build is about how to think institutionally about our problems. And it forced me to look into some of that academic literature, which is which I don't recommend. But, um, you know, it, it, the different different academic disciplines have very different ways of thinking about institutions. My way of thinking about it is basically that institutions are the durable forms of our common life. They're kind of the, the shape, the structure of the things we do together. They're the reasons why we're not just clumps of people in society. We're organized around certain purposes uh, in ways that give each person a role in relation to other people. So the family is obviously an institution this way. It gives people specific roles and responsibilities in relation to one another. There's such a thing as being a parent, as being a grandparent. That means something that helps people understand what their obligations are and also what kind of uh, w- what's owed to them by other people. But something like that happens in many of our other institutions where th- th- people are given a role in relation to a shared goal. And so some institutions are formal and corporate, a, a company or uh, a, 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 a civic institution, a school, a hospital. They have a, a legally formal kind of structure. Some institutions are not that formal. The, the family is like that. Uh, you can think of a profession as an institution. You can think of the rule of law as an institution. What holds them together is that they are durable forms. Over time, they change only slowly. And they're forms, right? They're shapes, they're structures, as I say. And so they help us understand how things are achieved in society and ultimately, they also form us. They form the people inside them. They have a certain kind of character, a certain kind uh, uh, of integrity, so that you can say, you know, there is such a thing in the world as a doctor or an accountant. Uh, that's a person formed by a set of professional institutions. And you can say when you watch somebody doing something, well, that's not what a doctor should be doing in this situation. And that actually means something to us mm. because we know how institutions form people. And all of that together basically means that institutions are the way that society functions. They're the way we actually achieve things together. They're the reason we're not just a bunch of isolated individuals, um, but are formed together around common purposes and ends. Right. So, I mean, things like the university, the uh, a, a corporate um, a culture. Yeah. I mean, I guess the SEAL teams, you know, we have a very specific yeah. sort of institutional culture. You can we can spot each other. From a distance, it's very funny, actually. <laughs> um, it's, it's like I can tell, I can tell that guy, a former SEAL, current SEAL. Um, you know, the the family, the church. Um, I, I would assume would be uh, yeah, an absolutely. important institution. I mean, there's so many a, a sense of local government, um, which I think we're we're losing to a to an extraordinary yeah. degree, and unfortunately. Um, and, and and you write that you know one problem is that. These institutions and their decay, they've become performative rather than formative. So can you explain what that means and and what kind of effect is that having? Yeah. So as I I say, one of the most important things that institutions do is that they form the people within them. They shape our character. They shape our soul. They shape us to be a certain type of person. But increasingly in American society, we've come to treat the institutions that we're part of not as formative, but as performative, not as molds that shape us, but as platforms for us to stand on uh, and, and perform and, and, you know, be part of the culture war and show people that we have the right opinions and not the wrong opinions so that there comes to be less of a difference between our different institutions. The New York times is a newspaper, right? Brown university is a university, but at this point they're both just places to stand and scream about oppression. There's not much of a difference between them. 
And they don't succeed in shaping the people within them very effectively because they just function as platforms for those people. And right. it's especially the case that they're platforms for a kind of political performance art and everything just comes to be performative so that everything we're seeing uh, it involves ways of kind of building your personal brand or building a following rather than playing a role within an institution. And that makes our institutions much harder to trust, among other things. It has to do with why the public has lost trust uh, to the degree that it has in so many of our institutions. Yeah, I mean, you, you could probably, we could just off the top of our head, I'm sure we could both just start naming in, important institutions that we believe have decayed quite a bit. Um, the press, mm -hmm. the New York Times. I mean, New York Times is an, an American institution to an, a, yep. an extraordinary degree. Um, but none of us trust it <laughs> at this yep. point. Um, they still might put out some good, some good, important investigative journalism every so often, but, but their biases make them um, completely untrustworthy. And uh, I think the recent, um, you know, firing of a op-ed editor is just yeah. opinion editor is just unbelievable. Um, the ACLU being another important institution that, that I, yeah. I, I I personally lost faith and just, just based on their commentary. And exactly. I think the SLU is actually a great example of how this change happens, which is there's an institution with a particular purpose. It's there to protect civil liberties, but instead it comes to function as a way to express a set of political opinions. And so when those opinions are in tension with what should be the purpose of the institution, uh, like around religious liberty or freedom of expression on campus, the institution has just given up on its fundamental purpose and instead just wants to be a place where people can say that they're on the left. Uh, that's happened in a lot of our major institutions. Yeah. And so and, and people on the right certainly feel that. Um, I think, I think, you know, you said before that you don't think that the, the left is on the verge of winning everything, but a lot of conservatives certainly disagree with you. They certainly, they definitely feel that way. It's a very emotional response. Yeah. Um, and I can see their point. Right. Because the, the, the vast majority of these important institutions, they seem to be being encroached upon by the left, if not completely taken over by the left, whether it's late night comedy, comedy in general, uh, sports, um, pop culture, Hollywood, all of these things. Of course, the ACLU, the press, the universities. I mean, I'm just going off the top of my head here. Um, and then, and then, and that they're even making, but they even make inroads in, into, you know, the conservatives most uh, cherished institutions, such as the church and, and, and family values as well, trying to, trying to deconstruct those. So I, I don't think it's all that crazy yep. for conservatives to feel under, under threat. Oh, I agree. It's not crazy, but I, I think ultimately that overestimates the actual appeal of these changes in the eyes of the American public. So it's certainly true that the left has made a kind of march through the institution. Some of these have always leaned left, some of them not so much, but all of them, I think, have become radicalized um, over the past generation or so in ways that we should absolutely worry about. But I think that process also opens up opportunities for the right to speak to people who are very dissatisfied with this process mm -hmm. so that if we see this not in purely political terms, but as institutions that are failing the people who depend on them because they've become politicized and radicalized, those are people we can speak to. Those are people that we have something to offer. If we see ourselves not as under siege, not as being crushed, but as having something to offer that in this situation, the American public wants. So conservatives haven't been losing, for example, every political fight or election uh, we lose some, we win some, but I think we win when we offer the public a way of understanding the kinds of problems that are now persistent in so many of our other institutions and offering some way through them, some way out of them, some way forward. I think conservatives need to make sure that we are helping the country see what we have to offer, not only in defensive terms, that we're not just asking for a safe space for ourselves. That's not an attractive way to approach the public. I think this way, for example, about the universities, the fight for the universities can't just be a fight for free speech. We can't just be saying we want room to say whatever we want to say. It, it needs to be a fight for the university. It needs to be a fight for an institution that offers the rising generation access to the best of our civilization. That's going to be much more attractive to parents and students. It's going to be attractive to some professors, though not enough maybe. Um, and I think it'll put us in a much stronger position if we if we confront the left by showing what we have to offer rather than 
by worrying about what they're taking away. Um, and so, you know, it just argues for confidence in politics, which I think is also is, is always a good idea. Yeah, and that's a valid point. I, I, I did agree with what you said earlier about we, we were defensive for panicking sometimes um, because the, the, the left has a tendency to surprise us. You know, we every, every time we think, OK, fine, that this is as far as they could possibly go. Boy, do they go further. And uh, whether that's on, whether that's political opportunism, whether that's I mean, that the extent they're willing to go to ruin somebody, to lie, to create a narrative. I mean, I I am certainly a, I'm personally a victim of these things. I, I, I cannot believe the amount of effort they go to to create something out of nothing. It's really unbelievable. We just don't do the same thing. We just don't. I mean, and part of that's because we don't have a right wing press that would that really caters to that. Uh, I'm sure all liberals would disagree with my statement, but then I would ask them, of course, for a little bit of uh, evidence. I know for a fact that left wing newspapers, including The New York Times, will publish things that our, our right wing journalists just won't. I just know I've seen it. Um, and, and so this, you know, actually gets to something you point out in your book about the press uh, and, and a point Benjamin Franklin made about the, the, the power of the press. And so, so what was the point he was trying to make? And how does that relate to what I, the point I just made? Yeah, you know, in thinking about the contemporary media environment um, in the book, I, I go back to the, the early American Republic um, and, and the, the colonial era too, where political journalism was in some, in some important ways a lot like what it is now. It was extremely partisan. It was um, it, it, it was diffuse and diverse. People had the ability to basically go into print. Uh, anybody who could get access to a printing press could put out a newspaper. And what they produced was very unreliable as a result. And often, as uh, I, I cite in the book, a piece that Benjamin Franklin wrote about this, um, it, it was often devoted to personal destruction, just to attacking political opponents uh, to destroy their character and and to uh, and to demean them in front of the public, and ultimately Franklin argues that in that situation um, it becomes impossible to defend the freedom of the press. That the freedom of the press is dependent upon a sense that the press has some responsibility, and more generally that all freedom rests on some idea of responsibility, of responsible use of of yeah. that liberty. Um, and you know I. I Part of what that argues for is a kind of institutional way of thinking about what journalism is. That it has to be held to a standard, and I, you know, we've lost sight of that standard in the course of precisely the sort of politicization that has happened to so many of our other institutions. So that when we come to think of major uh, media institutions as just more stages for political performance art, whether that's on the left or the right, and I think it happens on both, it becomes impossible to trust journalism and therefore it becomes impossible to have a sense that you have some reliable picture of reality uh, a, a particularly of political reality I think we're in that situation now and I think that it, it's in part a function of technological changes it's in part a function of this kind of politicization um, and it requires a recovery of some institutional responsibility and integrity that is not going to be easy because all the incentives point in the other direction, the political incentives, but also the financial incentives that face journalists. I argue that part of the reason this is happening is that individual journalists have massive incentives to put themselves out on Twitter as individuals claiming for themselves the authority of the newspapers or, or, or cable channels or whatever they work for but basically just building their own personal brand and following, making it impossible to tell the difference between what is their professional work and what is their personal opinion. And that's just unavoidably deadly to the integrity of journalism. And if you just check in on political Twitter right now, you'd find countless political journalists just systematically dismantling the integrity of their profession. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, I mean, is there a role for government to change that? Well, I am very reticent to look to government to change that um, because I think that government is a blunt instrument. And if you begin to have government try to regulate, uh, whether it's journalism or social media, I think the, the likelihood of bad outcomes is much greater than the likelihood that you will achieve exactly 
the subtle effect that you want. Um, and so yeah. I, I, I think this is a, this has to be handled again from the bottom up, which is how I think problems in general should be handled. The book argues yeah. for a change of attitude much more than for a public policy agenda. Yeah, and, and, I, and I agree. It's a cultural problem. Um, people have to stop rewarding exactly. bad, bad behavior. Um, and and people have to take accountability for that. I, I, I say this about their politicians and I say this about their press. You know, because what I notice is is this, the same person will say how much they distrust the press, but then they will repeat narratives and talking points that I know full well are coming uh, from the headlines of the same press that they distrust. Because, you know, yes, viewership is going down. Yes, subscribership is going down for all of these, um, you know, left wing papers. That's all true, but but their but their influence is still vast. And so I, I think conservatives sort of debate yeah. amongst ourselves about how much influence they really have. Like, should we really be worried or, or should we not be? I mean, it's, you know, conservatives still have the most traction per, you know, for one cable news channel um, or show uh, than, than any than anything Rachel Maddow can ever put out. Um, you know, we look at what gets the most viral um, clicks on on social media. It's generally conservative stuff. So in, in some ways, we're not doing terribly. But at the same time, what worries me is it, it more independent, you know, maybe slightly left of center people. They still repeat the same things that are that are getting spouted off by Rachel Maddow. That's very concerning. So it still gets to them somehow. And, and maybe it gets to them right. in a roundabout sort, sort of way, but it still gets to them. Yeah, it creates a kind of background culture. And, you know, I, I find this in my own experience sometimes. I, I would say almost every newspaper article I've ever read about something that I knew a lot about was profoundly wrong. And yet I then turn the page and read about something I don't know a lot about. And I say, oh, well, that's interesting. That must be what's going on there. And that's yeah. And somehow yeah, yeah. I, it, it doesn't it doesn't stick that. Well, when they write about things I know about, they're wrong. So maybe they're just wrong. Um, right. There's no and, question you know, whatsoever. To, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And this is why I, um, I you know, I, I came to conservatism more as I, I was always naturally conservative. Um, I, I never voted for a, a Democrat. But, you know, we, we, we eventually learn why we are conservatives uh, as, we, as, we, as we become more uh, entrenched in conservative philosophy and understanding the policies. And, and it, it would go – the reason because, is because over the years, as I would read the, the narrative put forth to me by maybe social media or mainstream media or just friend circles, um, and then confront that against a, a, a well-thought-out, you know, uh, counter arguments, maybe in a, a conservative think tank or, or national review or whatever it is, or national affairs, um, then, you know, it's like, wow, that was a much better argument. And they actually addressed, they confronted directly the arguments made, the narrative being put forth. And, um, you know, this led me to believe that, wow, like, I, I think they might, I think the left might be wrong about almost everything. Um, and what, what I point out to people is they're, they're wrong about how they want to solve problems. It doesn't mean they're wrong about what we should want, you know, and, and that's, that's the, that's the benefit of having a, a liberal and conservative dichotomy. Liberals point out things that maybe we should be striving for. Yeah. And that's healthy. I, I, I think that's a healthy thing. Um, it's just that yeah. their solutions are, always really, really bad. <laughs> I, I, I very much agree with that. I, I think it's also important for us to see that everybody is trying to do good. Almost everybody, not everybody maybe, but essentially nobody wakes up in the morning aiming to harm our country. We do differ about what would be good for it. And we differ in ways that are coherent, that we can figure out. And a lot of that has to do with differences about our understanding of human nature, our understanding of how social and political institutions work, those differences are very important, and they're the reason why uh, conservatives and uh, and progressives are sort of coherent groups in our politics, why people who have one kind of view about education, for example, also tend to have one kind of view uh, about the budget or about health care. It's not a coincidence that the, these views hang together on the, on the right and the left. And it, I, I think it's important to remind ourselves that the fundamental difference is not about whether you want what's good or what's bad for the country. The fundamental difference is how you understand how problems are solved, how change happens, how society works. Um, and, you know, that's an argument for taking the other side seriously, but also for seeing that 
we're likely to disagree in some pretty profound ways when it comes to public policy. Yeah. Yeah. And that's healthy. And it's supposed to be like that. I often get asked the question, okay, when are you guys going to come together and get stuff done? I'm like, okay, well, you know, it's, we're not supposed to necessarily, yeah. that that's like kind of the point, like, you know, there, there's, there's serious conflicts of vision um, on, on how our society should be run, you know, and it, it, because it, 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 it baffles me the, the, the extent to which, you know, good people, my own neighbors, you know, who will, who will have a nice conversation with me coming from the left, but like, they are willing to make people do things, um, their fellow citizens, and in such an authoritarian way that, that I just, that I find unbelievable, you know, and I, I don't know if we've always had that authoritarian streak. I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it is part of human nature to want everybody to be in it together and sort of live in a collective. I, I, I suppose that's part of human nature, but it doesn't work as you, as yeah. you scale it out to a, a larger country. It just doesn't. And, you know, our constitution doesn't assume that at some point we're all just going to come together and agree. It's, it's mm-hmm. premised on the notion that these differences are permanent and we have a set of institutions that uh, that compels us to bargain and compromise, but doesn't assume that the different parties are that the the, the differences between us are just going to go away. Uh, and in that sense, the American system is particularly realistic. I think about the nature of political life. Yes. It, it doesn't it doesn't just empower a majority to have its way all out. Our Congress is not a European Parliament. It assumes that differences are enduring. And I think that's very smart, and it's part of the reason for the success of our political system. It's also part of the reason I worry that Congress in particular isn't working especially well now, um, and that its members, uh, with very few exceptions like yourself and a few others we could name, uh, are inclined to turn over its power to the other branches of government and to, and to stand aside and, uh, and, and, and wait for the president to do what they like or wait for a president they like to be elected. I think it's enormously important to see that our system of government is Congress centered and that Congress in turn is based on the idea that there are some basic differences in our society that aren't just going to disappear. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our constitution protects the ability to disagree. That's, that's a fundamental, fundamentally important thing. And that's what, when I, when I'm asked that question, I need to remind people of that. Like it's, it's, it is working. The system is working the way yeah. it's supposed to. It, it, maybe it's working too much. Maybe there's actually too much happening based on, based on, on what the, the national or, or based on what our constitution said should happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, and also when you say get things done, I'm, I'm, I promise you your neighbor disagrees with you on right. what get things done actually means. I bet if you get a bunch of like-minded people at a dinner party, you're all going to differ in opinion on what get things done actually means or, or how to solve a complex problem. And so it should, it should be, it should be rather difficult to, for 435 people to agree on what get things done actually means, especially when they represent such a, a wide array of, of people. You know, with Tim, Senator Tim Scott's words really stuck with me when he was talking about the police reform bill that Democrats basically torpedoed because they never really wanted a solution to that. But what he said was, you know, what's crazy about all of these things that we're all debating on and about to pass here in the Senate and then in the House and hopefully come together on, which we never did. He said, you know, what's crazy about all this is this could happen right now at every city. You don't need the federal government to do this. This is all performative. It's a performative yep. gesture because we are failing to teach our citizens where things actually happen and who is actually accountable. You know, it struck me as, as unbelievable that Governor Cuomo basically made his pandemic career off of blaming others and never taking accountability for anything. He was uh, at any given press conference. He was either blaming de Blasio, which he probably should, let's be honest, or or blaming the president. Right. Yeah. You know, yesterday he's saying, thank you. You know, we've gotten everything we needed from the federal government, but or blaming other governors, just just randomly going and finger pointing uh, to other governors, which has nothing to do with with New York. It was just. It's so petty. Yeah. But the problem is, is that it's rewarded. It's rewarded. It's 80 percent approval ratings. You well, know? And I think <laughs> a, an, an, an enormous proportion of our politicians now in America basically think complaining about the president is their job. It, it, it happens in county commission meetings in the county where I live in Maryland. They spend an amazing amount of their time complaining about, you know, the president's approach to immigration and other things. 
and maybe you agree with him and maybe you don't, but you have a different job to do. And yeah, that's it, so it, ridiculous. Know, it can't all be just a stage for talking about the president. Right. We, we have to stop rewarding politicians that basically express that do a good job expressing your current sentiment. Yeah. And we, we, we have to be able to rec- recognize emotional manipulation when we see it. And, and this is this worries me that we're unable to do that because that's what's happening when, when a politician gets up there, whether it's about the pandemic or whether it's about the riots and they just express a series of platitudes. People are scared right now. We want safe communities. These are highly agreeable things yeah, to say. Sure. But like, what is your point, though? You caused this with your terrible, you know, prosecution, you know, uh, prosecutorial dis- dis- indiscre- or discretion or indiscretion, however, whatever you would call yeah. it. You're letting criminals back out on the streets. You're not confronting crime. This is happening in cities all across America, uh, including here in Houston. We haven't had the same bad crime. Well, the crime has increased, but we haven't had the same bad crime waves. But we're doing the same crazy policies that everybody else is. And we're seeing results from that. And they're not good results. Mm-hmm. But uh, but politicians take no take yeah. no accountability. And we are not holding them accountable. And it is part of that larger trend toward a kind of performativeness in other institutions, too, including in, in our economic or corporate institutions where, you know, you listen to a CEO go on and on. And you think, OK, maybe I agree with that opinion, maybe not. But you run a shoe company. Why are you even do- talking about this? <laughs> it's it's yeah. Oh, man, it's it's tough. OK, so uh, la- last question before we end, then. OK, g- given given your vision of conservatism, um, which I, I agree with, uh, how should we be selling it? I mean, you know, what 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 is the pitch to the American people that that helps translate these? What, what are complex philosophical ideas into things that people can understand? Are there issues that we should be focusing on in particular? Is there new is there new approaches to certain issues that we should be focusing on? What what we should be what should what would be your advice? Yeah, it, it, it's a wonderful broad question, and I, I think in general, conservatives need to offer the country a better way to solve problems, and that is both a philosophical pitch and a, a political or policy pitch. I think it's a philosophical pitch in the sense that we ultimately believe that problems are solved when people make better decisions. And that that can mean politicians, that can mean people in our communities, that can mean ourselves in our own families. Um, And that's not that can't happen by government taking over those decisions, but it can be helped by government creating some of the circumstances, some of the conditions that enable people to have choices in their lives and enable people to flourish. And it can happen by government protecting the environment in which our country can thrive. So that when we ask ourselves about individual policy arenas, we should ask if that's what we're doing. And I think that when it comes to education or healthcare or welfare, we've got to be empowering people, not taking over their ability to control their own lives, but genuinely giving them the power and the dignity to make choices for themselves. That can then become much more sort of programmatic, wonky policy thinking. Um, where there are ways of thinking about welfare that involve empowering local institutions and letting them play a role in people's lives. There are ways of thinking about education that involve letting families choose how their children are formed in life. There are ways of thinking about healthcare that let people make decisions about what their own priorities are. I think when you get to the level of policy, it's easy to see how this defines a very basic difference between left and right. But that difference begins at a more profound level about how we really think about how our country thrives and what the role of its government is. So I think that theoretical or philosophical level can be connected to practical solutions in ways that can speak to the country and can speak to people's sense that things aren't going very well. We do need to be more practical. We do need to be more positive and constructive and not just engage in an argument about how bad things are and who ruined them. But think about what we want for the future that we don't have in the present and how that might happen. Oh, that's a great way to put it. And and, and I like the the sense there. We, we, we need to prop up institutions that work. And that does require a little bit of government action. Um, and we, we you yeah. know, not not a lot, but we, we can we can maintain our principles while also, you know, moving forward and I guess in the language of, of movement as the Democrats like to use, but it's but it works for people. Um and um, and I and I think it I think it should 
I think it has a lot of promise. We stand for we stand for the things that work, and we and we stand for uh, the best way to solve the problems. Um, Yuval Levine, thank you so much for for being on. Thank you, I appreciate it.